For those of you who are new to our church, we are nearing our 10-year anniversary in September. And whenever we bought this, this had been a church and we bought it, we had a, a, a large group of people that were at our home church in Santa Mall that, that came over here and helped plant this church. And I, Aggie and I came soon behind that. It was an amazing group of people. Man, just gave of their time, their heart, all of it. And church is built on that. Church is built on people who just give of their best with joy. And there was a member of our team, she was a young adult, who uh, just was full of life. You knew it when she walked in the room. She was full of joy. She was a little loud. But she was, she was loud with her hugs, loud with her voice, loud with her love. She just poured all of herself out. She had grown up in a very difficult household. And through one of our church family members, they brought her in when she was a teenager into their home and into their family. Just loved her and introduced her to Jesus. And man, she fell in love with Jesus. She got plugged into church and fell in love with church. Her new family. And though she had difficult days, she just was full of energy, full of life. She served everywhere. She was on a worship team. She helped kids. She helped with youth. She was always here. Church was open. She was here, and she just loved being here because she knew what God had done in her life through church. And everywhere she went, she told everybody about Jesus. Her blood family, friends at school. If you didn't know her, it didn't matter. She's going to tell you about Jesus. And she, she's going to tell you about our church. And when I, when I would see her, to me, she, she represented us so well. To me, she was the best of us. Sunday, April 24th of 2015, I'm driving. Leave my house right around the corner here, heading to, back to our home church for the, for the evening service. Get a few miles down the road, and I noticed there's a, a wreck on the side, and the first responders were there. So they're routing traffic around, and I look, and I, I the car looks familiar to me. But I just keep going. I get about 10 minutes down the road, and I get a phone call. At this, this dear lady, that was her car. So I turn around and I race back, just feeling so bad that I pass it up. I'm like, I knew that was her car. And I get there, her body's laying on the ground. Passed away, killed instantly. I call the family that took her in. They live right down the road. They came and we're just crying, crying. Have our funeral. Funeral. We had the funeral here. This place was packed. We had every chair we could find all the way to the back wall. Nearly 400 people were here that day. Her life still spoke in her funeral. And the family members that she'd been praying for, many of them got saved that day. Move of God. It was incredible. But we leave that event. I had questions. And my question was, why her, God? She's the best of us. Life. She poured love out on everybody. She poured love on me. I have memories of just her never being uncomfortable around me. Sometimes people are kind of like unsure how to react around the pastor, not her. She just, it's like you're her best friend, and she treated me that way. Involved in everything. You know, it's interesting, when we began the series last week, I, I even said it, I was like, you know, this series, really, I've never dealt with this. The Lord said, really? You've never been disappointed in me? Let me remind you. And he brought an area in my heart that still hurts, to be honest. Every now and then when I pass by where she was killed, I still have that question. Why God? Why her? understand. I'm not mad. I don't question God. Didn't, didn't in my case shake my faith, but I still just wonder. 
And even this week as I thought about her. It's hard. Sometimes there's difficult things in our journey that can just shake our faith, can it? Things we don't understand. And we have those why God moments. God, why did you allow that? For me, why did you let Alyssa leave? Why did you take her? Why did you stop it? For some, it's why did you put me in this family? Some is, why did you let me lose that job? Brothers, why did you let that person do that to me? Why, why did my job come to an end? And I went through all these difficult struggles. I didn't do anything wrong. Why, why is this going on? And, and the, those why questions, can what happens, it can lead to doubts and disappointments with God. It can, sh- it can just shake us. It's hard. But, but as a Christian now, there's this struggle because we know God never makes a mistake. He's always perfect. He does everything right. And we, we have that, with that knowing in our head, but man, inside of us, we're hurting. We're confused. We got questions and it's like there's no answer. And sometimes it's like God is silent in that moment. Where are you, God? Why are you not answering me? What is happening? And it seems like there's no resolution to it. Man, it can be a big hurt. That's happening inside of us. What happens is if we don't resolve these feelings, it can just lead us down a a dangerous path. It It can lead to more hurt. It can lead to some challenging thoughts that are hard to deal with. It it can be an open door for the enemy going, you see, God's not there for you, or God's not real. It can be a struggle. Some even leave the faith. The the Bible says when, when there's doubt present, it's like we're out there in the ocean, battered by the waves, tossed to and fro. And sometimes that's what happens is, It's like we love God, but man, I have these feelings. I'm going to church to listen, but is the word of God real for me? And on and on, it's like we're tossed back and forth. We worship God in moments, but then we're like, where were you? And we're battered around by those waves. So we're in a series to talk about it. Because there's real answers to what's going on inside of us. We we want real healing from this. Because without it, man, it's like it just cuts our feet out from under us, doesn't it? This year, God gave us a a theme word. It's this word foothold. And it's, it's to be in a stable, strong position so you can advance forward and climb higher. Well, man... If your faith in God is shaken, you just cut your feet out. There's no strong foothold there. But God says, we need to talk about it because there actually are answers to healing, to get us back in a stable place for us to move forward in our walk with God. Last week, we talked about several Bible figures, and I'm going to bring up three more today that, that had this. I'm going to put up a statement that kind of describes them. It's, it's a simultaneous wrestling with disappointment while also embracing the goodness of God. It's actually questioning, yet trusting. Those don't all seem like they go together, do they? But that's kind of what happens. There's a man named Habakkuk. He wrote a a very short book of the Bible. It's only three chapters long. It's one of the minor prophets. You may have never even heard about it. Probably can't find it in your Bible right now. If I said everybody turn to Habakkuk, you'd be going, what page number, Pastor? Which one is that? Um, But it's interesting about him. His name has two meanings that go together. 
One means to wrestle and to embrace. He was wrestling with God while he was embracing God. And if you go back during his time, he was a prophet during a difficult time in Israel's history. And Habakkuk had questions. And it's the, his book can do a little oversimplification, but basically broken down into three parts. His first chapter was complaining. What's up, God? Really? Really? This is what's going on? This is what's got to happen? This is how you're going to treat us? We dealt with that last week. And, and some of you had time at the altar. We just came up to God and just was like, really? So the, the, he expresses his doubts. And the second, he just pours it out on God in his second chapter. And that, in the second chapter, there's lots of questions. I, just got, I got questions for you, God. In the third chapter, he just steps back and he waits for God to answer. And God certainly does answer. But we'll see from his case and others, this thought is that God is big enough to handle your doubts while you seek him. You may think those don't go together. Well, the Bible said not have doubts. But what we're going to find out is God's big enough to handle your doubts. All throughout Scripture, people had doubts. And they were honest with God with them. Big doubts, big moments. But I want you to see his thought is that he loves you enough to be patient with your questions and doubts. What's interesting is parents especially with our young kids, when they have a question or they're unsure about something, they're going to let you know. How many of you have ever rejected your five-year-old just because they had questions? How many of you rejected your five-year-old because they didn't believe you? Have you ever gotten this back at you? Nuh-uh. Yeah, it's that way. Nuh-uh, no, it's not. No, it is. No, it's not. Did you say, get out, leave? Did you, did you throw them away? What's interesting, where do we get that from? The Father. Because He doesn't do that. He says, hey, you got questions, you got doubts. Okay. Let's go on that journey. Sometimes, even those questions come from a crisis of belief. I've shared the story before. There's a good friend of mine who walked through something incredibly challenging. His oldest daughter, when she was in high school, died from a rare heart condition. Horrible tragedy. But in that, they found out what she had was hereditary. So they went and got tested. We'll come to find out. My friend's wife and two of his remaining three daughters all had the same issue. So my friend's going, am I about to lose most of my family? And he had, it was the first time I ever heard this, but, but what a phrase. He said, I had in that moment when I heard the diagnosis about my wife and my other two daughters while dealing still with the loss of my oldest daughter. He said, I had a faith-shaking moment. He said, it shook my very faith in God. But my friend did something amazing. Instead of letting that lead him away from God with his why questions, he took his why question and he said, I'm going to keep seeking you, God. I'm going to keep going after you. I'm not going to let that pers take me away from you, but I got questions. I've got big disappointments. I've got some now doubts because I pray health over my family, but yet this is going on. But he never let it take it away, him away from God. Now, if he were up here, and he's actually preached before at churches I've been at, and he has shared his journal. He is real in his journal, y'all, like real. 
But what's interesting, he's allowed that to bring him to God instead of away from God. And I want you to see this thought, is that questions, doubts, and disappointments are not a cause for panic. But what they are, they're a reason to press into God. And then if they're handled properly, they can add a, add a, actually be a catalyst to stronger faith. It may seem like the opposite. But the, ultimately, it's, it's how we choose to respond in that moment. We may go, I'm a Christian, I'm not allowed to do this, kind of have a panic moment. Don't let it be that. Let it see just as an opportunity to move you to God. In other words, it doesn't have to take you away from God. It can bring you closer to him. And I want to introduce you to a phrase. And I found this phrase so helpful for people in their journey when they're facing doubts and disappointments, maybe even a crisis of belief. And for some of you today, this is going to be an aha moment for you. And you're going to be like, I can grab a hold of that because if you knew what was going on in my mind and heart, Pastor, you see it's a lot of turmoil between me and God. And you're struggling, wondering what to do. Here's your phrase. I want to believe. I want to believe. And the great thing is, that's enough for God to work with. Sometimes it feels like our faith is tested till there's nothing left. We're just pushed to the brink. We're empty. Nothing's there. Let me ask you some questions. What if that tiny, barely there faith is still pleasing to God? What if simply wanting to believe is the mustard seed of faith that Jesus spoke about? Jesus said a mustard seed is enough to move a mountain. <laughs> you don't feel that way. But I'll give you this thought. The mustard seed of faith still accomplishes great things. The I want to believe. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible, there's a man who had a son, a young son, who was actually demon-possessed. This demon kept trying to kill his son. At times he'd try to throw him into a fire. And what we learn now, what we know now is it was basically seizures. Other times he'd be thrown into the water trying to drown him. The father's desperate. Probably went to doctors, probably went to all kinds of people looking for answers, and none was found. And so he hears about Jesus and his disciples, and, and it happens to be the disciples are going to be in his area. So he grabs up his son and says, maybe. So he goes there into town, and, and it was a crazy scene, y'all. It was like disciples are there trying to do their work, but there's also the religious leaders kind of kind of criticizing them and mocking them. There's just a crowd watching, wondering going to happen, and the disciples... I think we're a little bit overwhelmed. Well, they couldn't get the demon out. Well, Jesus happens to come up along a little bit later, and so uh, kind of like us when we have a bad experience at a restaurant, he goes to the manager. He's like, look, y'all promised healing. Your boys couldn't do it. And I kind of imagine the scene. We, 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 don't, we don't see all the details in the Bible, but I imagine the scene of all this crowd that Jesus gets right in that man's world for a moment and tunes everybody else out. It's looking right in that man's eyes. And this man asked this question. He said, if you can heal my son, and Jesus goes, if I can, he says, anything's possible if you believe. Wow, what a powerful statement. So the man just throws out, well, then I believe. That's the answer from a boy, then I believe. But Jesus looking right in his eyes, seeing into the depths and the reality of his heart, and that man feels it. And he makes, to me, one of the most powerful statements in all the Bible. Help my unbelief. 
Sometimes aren't we like that? We in here in the worship song singing, I believe, I believe, God, you're all powerful. And inside, I don't know. I don't know. What was the father saying to Jesus? I want to believe. Last week, I shared a story about a good friend of mine who walked through something very difficult when they were a teenager. Horrific. Horrific what they went through. And it caused them just to question God because things that were done to them, they prayed that it wouldn't happen, but yet it still did. So now they're wondering, God, where are you? Can I believe you? Well, I want to finish the story or tell you more about it. They kept pursuing God. In the midst of this wrestling and struggling, they still kept coming. They still kept waking up every day, getting out of bed, and taking a step forward toward Jesus. Hard. Hard, hard to read your Bible when you're wondering if it's true for you. Hard to, listen, hard to sing a worship song when the words don't match your experience. But yet they kept taking a step forward toward Jesus. <laughs> and in that journey, one day, Jesus showed up in a big way. But you know what fueled them? Because they even said this one time while we were visiting. I want to believe. And I said, that's enough. That's your answer. And because they had that powerful faith, which for us, we may go, that's not that powerful, huh? Mustard seed. That God said, that's enough. And Jesus showed up. And can I just tell you, the day of salvation came. Every day, some of you, you're struggling. Can I give you some advice? Every day, wake up. Get out of bed. You may want to hide. I've done it in my life. Just put the covers over my head going, really? I don't even want to get out of this bed because I know it's ahead of me. But you get out of bed and you just take one step toward God. Every day. When you do, God will show up. Let me show you this using the most famous doubter of all time. His name was Thomas. And I know he's the most famous doubter because even the Bible calls him Doubting Thomas. In fact, some Bibles, they put that in the Bible, Doubting Thomas. How do you like that label for eternity? In God's Word. Doubting Randy. You know, <laughs> put that on my tombstone. Doubting Randy. I mean, isn't that great? That's what how you remembered by. But I want you to see his story because it's so powerful. And I want to go to John 20, 24. And this is where the story begins, the famous doubting story. Je Jesus had been crucified. He's buried and, all, and then he's resurrected. And he meets with the disciples. Yet, Thomas wasn't there. So the disciples find Thomas later and like, dude, Jesus is alive. It was amazing. Awesome. We got to see him. But he said to him, right. Let me tell you what. Unless I see the hands of the imprint of the nails and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. The story's too fantastic. Y'all ain't serious. And now the label Doubting Thomas gets stuck on him. I would say this. He got a bad rap. I disagree with the label. See, the doubt makes sense because he didn't see Jesus. It's too fantastic. He didn't see him. I, I I'll say this. Thomas was a realist. He had real issues and real questions. Can anybody relate? Can anybody, if we went around the room, say, I got some real issues? 
If you were honest, would you say, I've got some real questions even about God? We're a room full of Thomases. He got a bad rap. Because maybe you've had unanswered questions. Maybe you had experiences that don't quite match the sermon you heard. God's always good, answers all your prayers, always there. And you're kind of going, mm, I don't know. My experiences don't seem to match that. You have questions. Maybe you have doubts. Maybe you have disappointments. Even this, we know the story. Jesus said, I'm leaving and I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. So when I come back for you, I got a place where you're going to go. And look at this, uh, John 14, 5. It says, and Jesus said, you know the way, you know the way to where I'm going. He just makes this blanket statement. And I imagine all the disciples were going, we don't understand what he's saying, but let's just nod our head. Yeah, we know where he's going. But yet Thomas does something brave. He speaks up and he says, no, we don't, Lord. <laughs> We have no idea where we're going. How, how will you know the way? Thomas is a realist. He wasn't the, the yes, I'm just going to nod my head. He's like, no, I got a question because I don't understand what you're saying. He had real questions, and he was bold enough to do that. I want you to read this quote by the famous Oswald Chambers. Some of y'all read his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. But he said this. He says, doubt is not always a sign a man is wrong. It may be a sign he's thinking. So let me show you this, is when we use our questions, our doubts, and our disappointments as motivation to serve God, He always shows up. Deuteronomy 4.29 says this. It says, from there, and He was talking to where the Israelites, they'd gone through a journey. It says, from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find Him if you search Him with all your heart and soul. I want you to see those two words, from there. Where's from there? From where you are. Where you are right now, even in your doubt, your questions, your disappointments, from that place, if you just get out of, wake up, get out of bed, and take a step forward toward God, look what He promises. You're going to find Him if you search for Him. So going back to Thomas's journey, Thomas never gave up. He had doubts. He didn't believe the disciples. But he didn't stop. Look at this and as we continue in, in verse 26. It says, eight days later, the disciples were, were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. He kept showing up. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing there. And I love this statement. He says, peace be to you. I wonder if he was looking at Thomas in that moment. I wonder if Thomas's heart just sank going, oh no, what's he going to say? No peace. And then he says, looks at, he says to Thomas, he came to him personally, he said, look, here's my hand, Thomas. I don't think this was a rebuke. I didn't say, I didn't think he said, hey, doubting Thomas, come on. I think he said, hey, Thomas, come see, let me show you. Let me show you I'm real to you in this moment. I'm here and I'm here for you. And then he says this, the end of verse 27, he says, don't be faithless any longer. You can believe. You can believe I'm real. And I love Thomas's response in verse 28. My Lord and my God. Because Jesus showed up. This isn't on the screen, but you may want to write this down. If you keep showing up to meet Jesus, He will show up. Every day. Step toward Jesus, he'll show up. Matthew 7, 7 through 8, well-known group of scriptures. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And that, that is a, uh, that's a promise. It says, for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. Everyone who knocks, the door is going to be open. But let me tell you about that word, ask, seek, and knock. Because in black and white, it kind of sounds like a one-time thing. And, and for those of you who like the English language and love studying it, I do. I want to tell you about the tense of those three words. They, it's present, it's active, and it's imperative. What does present mean? You're, you, it, it's like now. 
It's now. Not then, not future. It's now. It's active, meaning you are doing it. And it's imperative, meaning there's energy, there's urgency behind it. So really the, the, the verse could be this, asking, and it'll be given to you. Seeking, you will find. Knocking, and the door will be opened to you. The asking is like a demanding. I want to know. I can't demand anything from God. Really? That's not what that word means. That we're like pressing the door of heaven, going, I need to know, and I need you, God. I need you in this moment, and I'm not giving up. I'm not stopping. I'm not letting my questions lead me away from you. No, I'm leading to you, and you better open the door. And God's going, I hear you. I hear you. Promise. We just keep seeking God. What's interesting is, old doubting Thomas <laughs> was an incredible evangelist, martyred for his faith, even at death. When they said deny Jesus, he's like, no, I will not. Because he had questions that allowed him to bring him to Jesus, and Jesus showed up. Another story. One that some people criticize, old Peter. Peter's one of the 12 disciples, and Peter was kind of a, an arrogant man. He's one that kind of, you know, spoke before he thought type thing, put, put the foot in the mouth. That was him. A lot of times he would say things, and, and he's the one Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan. I mean, that's pretty tough right there. Well, well one night, they're out on a boat. Jesus says, how want you go to the other side? Jesus stays behind. And they go sailing, and Jesus says, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to walk over there. So instead of going around on land, Jesus said, now I'm just going to take a shortcut through the lake. So he walks on water. Well, disciples see him, and naturally what we'd all think, that's a ghost, because people don't walk on water. So they kind of get a little frightened. And then they kind of look at us like, that looks like Jesus. Is that you, Jesus? Yeah, it's me. And Peter says this amazing, bold, foot-in-your-mouth statement. If it's really you, call me out on the water, and I'll come. Jesus says, come on. And Peter could have had a moment going, no, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. No, Peter does something actually amazing. He climbs out of the boat. And he steps on water and he walks. Big faith moment. And we know the rest of the story. We'll pick it up in Matthew 14, 30. It says, but seeing the wind, he became frightened. He kind of focused on the reality of the situation. Can't sometimes that happen? God says, move forward in faith. Amen. And we get prayed over in church, and we're like ready to go chase hell with a water pistol, right? But we get out there, and the reality hits us, and we're like, what did I just do? People criticizing us. The enemy speaking in your ear. Your own... Your own insecurities rise up. We see the wind and the waves. And we begin to sink, just like Peter did. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And I love this. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him, and lifted him up. And, and I, I think this next sentence isn't an accusation. I really believe it's an invitation. He says this, you have little faith. I almost see Jesus like with a smile on it going, come on, Peter. Man, this is me. I wouldn't let you down. But he extends his hand. He doesn't go sink, you doubter, you faithless one. Just go ahead and die. I wonder how many times we've criticized other Christians. You just need to get over it. You just need to move on from that. You just need to have faith in God. Sink. Instead, we lift our hands out and say, I'm with you. Let me help you. 
I'll walk with you. That's what Jesus does. See, Jesus' statement wasn't to condemn, it was to encourage. We also know this about Peter. Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified, you're all going to leave. Peter goes, "Uh uh-uh. All these other dudes, they can roll out. I'm with you. Jesus goes, no. In the morning, there's a rooster that's going to crow. You'll have already denied me three times. But yet, Jesus went to Peter after that, didn't he? After Jesus was resurrected, Peter had gone back to fishing. Jesus didn't go, well, you ain't with me anymore. I'm rolling out too. No, he shows up where Peter was. Peter jumps in the boat, runs there, and Jesus just pours love on him. That's what Jesus does. He's not distant in your doubts. He's right there. He's just saying, use that to step toward me, and I'm right there with you. So I want you to see his thought is that God is not distant in your doubts. If you feel far from him, reach out in love. Because he's reaching out to you. Doubt is an invitation to a deeper faith. Interesting, Peter wrote this later in 1 Peter 2.25. He said, you are straying like sheep. I wonder if when he wrote that, he's like, man, I was one of them. But now, you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Some of you, your difficulties has allowed you to kind of stray away. Can I encourage you to come back? Don't let your disappointments, your questions, your push you away from God, but let it draw to you, and He's waiting there for you. I'd recommended a book. It's in your handout. Uh, amazing book on this very topic. And Craig Rochelle wrote it. He said this. He said, if you wrestle with Him, seek Him. Cling to Him. And God will meet you in your pain. Catch this thought. Is that God is there for you even if you're doubting, disappointed, or mad at Him. In your moment, He's reaching out His hand out of the wind and waves where you're sinking and saying, I got you. I'm right here with you in your journey. And sometimes in church world, we kind of use certain phrases. And, and, and one of them is the valley and the mountaintop. And I think if we've been Christians long enough, we've experienced both of them. Well, valley is that low point where we don't want to be. We want to be in the mountaintop, those high, those high experiences. And look, I love the mountains. I love climbing mountains. I love going to the top and just seeing out. I think it's beautiful. Love those moments. And sometimes when we go through difficulties, we back in the valley, where all we think about is, I just want to be back on that mountaintop. I want that mountaintop experience again. I can't stand being in the valley. We just want our, our difficulties gone, all our doubts, all our disappointments gone, just back on the mountaintop where everything's good, everything's great, right? Well, let me give you this thought. The valley's not where we want to be, but it's often where God does his greatest work. I can't say why God allowed you to go through what you're going through. But I can tell you this, at that low point where you may be, that's where God does his greatest work. And I want to encourage you, don't leave. Y'all know this in Psalm 23, verse 4. It says, even though I walk through the valley, and it seems like death is right there, I don't need to fear evil. Why? Why? you're with me the greatest promise in all the Bible that God is right there with us in our journey Greg Rochelle went on to write this he said if like Habakkuk we're willing to lean into the hardship we're experiencing and wrestle with how God might use it to achieve his purposes then we can begin to climb out of the valley you have to remember though just because things aren't going your way doesn't mean 
God isn't still working. Our response matters. We can every day just choose to wake up, get out of bed, take a step toward God, or we can shrink back from life or run away from God. As we saw what Job said last week, his attitude was, though he slay me, though God do this to me, tough thought, he said, yet I will hope in Him. Y'all can put that verse up for me, please. Yet I will hope in Him. Use I want to believe to draw you close to God. I'm going to get you to just bow your head and close your eyes right where you are. If you're watching online, right where you are, just bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to get everybody just a moment to get settled. Because God wants to do something big in this moment. Some of you right now, you're in that crisis of belief. You're wondering, where's God? I don't see Him. I don't feel Him. I don't hear Him. Almost seems like He's against me. I keep praying, but nothing happens. In fact, it keeps going the opposite way of my prayers. I don't understand what hap- why this is happening to me. You may be in that place. Or maybe it's happened to you before. Kind of like my experience with my friend whose life, to me, was taken way too soon. She had so much to give. And our church benefited from it. And I just don't understand Maybe something happened in your journey years ago and you're still showing up, but man, it kind of still lives with you. I don't know where you're at in your journey. But I'm encouraging you today to have an I want to believe. And I promise you it's enough. Because that's right where God meets us. So my question is, how should you respond to God today? You continue to run toward Him? I don't know. Maybe some of you today, you say, you know what, I followed Jesus years ago. Something happened. And I ran away. But today I'm ready to come back. For you, today is the day of salvation. You're ready to give your heart back to Jesus. Or maybe that's a first-time decision. I don't know. But today you're ready to respond right. I want to pray for you. Father, right now I just pray for your grace over us. You know the insides. You know... Some of us, we may be in turmoil. We're struggling, oh God. And, 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 and our struggle is with you. I feel like you've let us down. Lord, I'm asking for mustard seed of faith today. I'm praying for those who are struggling that there's just the seed of I want to believe that propels them enough just to get up and take one step towards you. I'm praying for those today that this is their day, that they're choosing you with their whole heart. Maybe it's returning to you. That Lord, just your grace would be there to help us. That we're not alone. And Lord, I'm asking that you would just let us feel your presence in this moment. Just comforting us there for us. And that you help us as only you can. Lord, we need you. We need you in our frailty. Lord, I'm thankful that that's when you show up. Is in those moments. And that when we are weak, you're strong for us. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh God.
We love you, O oh Lord. We honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just for one moment get your attention. If you're in this room, we're going to open up this altar in just a moment. Casey's going to tell you about it. Can I encourage you today? Don't be so quick to leave. Because you need to have a moment with God. We'll even have some of our prayer team up here after service. Maybe you just need to talk to somebody. Maybe you need to share what's on your heart. Maybe you need to sit, tell your story. Maybe you just need to tell God something. Whatever it is. Don't leave before you get everything you need from God. Amen. I love you guys so much. I hope you all have a great rest of your week.